let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, great. So I wanted to give the audience a choice. Uh, so I've got two talks on gears that I could give. One of them is sort of an advanced level talk, creating a client-side search engine with Dojo and gears. So in the example, we make an example, client-side search engine. I'll show you how to use that. And then we go really deep, and you see the code. It's pretty advanced. And then there's an introduction to gears talk, which is more expansive. It goes over a bunch of the different gears modules that are available. So I kind of wanted to let, they're both good. You'll walk away with lots of interesting material. But I thought it might be fun to sort of let y'all decide. Um, so who would like to see the introduction to gears talk? OK, I'll, I'll kind of count that. If it's a, who wants to see the, uh, this one, creating a client-side search engine? Oh, it's pretty close. <laughs> and who, who's OK either way? Yeah. So I think technically, I think there was a few more people for the introduction. So let's see. So who here um, feels very comfortable with JavaScript? OK, that's pretty good. Um, how about this? How about we'll, we'll flip a coin? I think it's pretty cool. Who wants to flip a coin? Do you mind? Is it called a, a, a crown or a kopeck? How do you, a crown? So flip. Flip. Whoa. <laughs> we'll flip a crown. So um, a, a dragon. We do this one. <laughs> is it? A, it is a dragon. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a lion. <laughs> Look at me, um, it's my first time here. And uh, a crown? <laughs> we'll do the introduction, so let's see. Wait, that wasn't a very good flip, was it? Flip <laughs> that wasn't either. <laughs> OK. OK, we're doing, we're doing this one. <laughs> but you have no way to know what it really was, right? <laughs> Cool. So, uh, so my name is Brad Newberg. I work with Google and the Gears team. And uh, I want to talk to you about today's agenda. This is good. I like this talk. This is like the fire hose talk. Uh, I'm going to begin by introducing you to what Gears is, if you don't know. And then we'll talk about PubTools Search. That's this client-side search engine that I'll demo to you. It's a, a little simple open source library I made that you can drop in your page to kind of have a client-side search engine. I'll show you how to use that, and then we'll really crack that open and really see how that's built. I'll introduce you to some of the Gears modules that you'll need to know to really start understanding the code. We'll go into the architecture. You'll see the architecture in the flow. I'll introduce you to Dojo using code snippets from the, from the PubTool search itself. And then I'll share with you some tips and some tricks when you're doing advanced Gears. And again, at any time, if I'm talking too fast or something I say doesn't make sense, please raise your hand. I won't beat you up. Um, you know, some, if I talk too fast, you know, for translation, things like that, please, please tell me. I get too excited up here talking. So let's start with uh, what is Gears. Um, so who here has heard of Gears? Who here knows what it is? <laughs> okay, good. I, I'm not. I won't call on you. Here's what Gears is. So. What we have today is we've got the current situation. This is kind of the browser as it is today. And it has JavaScript, CSS, HTML. And browsers are sitting on these computers, these laptops, that are super powerful. They've got like 100 gigabyte hard drives. They have multiple CPUs. And yet the browser can't access any of this. It's forced to, to run like a Commodore 64. <laughs> or what, what, was, what was a popular old personal computer in Prague? Sinclair. Timex Sinclair. Right, with 4K, is that right, it had 4K? Something, had half a K maybe, I don't know. So what Gears does is it extends what the browser can do in a secure way with these Gears modules to let you start taking advantage of these really powerful machines that we have. And it does this in a way that hooks into existing web browsers. It hooks into Windows Mobile on mobile devices, uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, to really give you a cross-browser way to do more things in a secure way. Um, who here's heard of HTML5? 
Okay, so HTML5 is the next version of HTML. It's being produced. Some browsers are starting to implement parts of it. One of the problems is it takes a long time for anything new on the web to show up in enough places that you can actually use it. So Gears, one of the cool things about Gears is it's a way to get new stuff into the existing web. And more and more and more you'll see Gears being a way to get HTML5 into existing web browsers. So things like HTML5 offline, we'll talk about offline. Actually, we're not going to talk about offline today, unfortunately. But things like local storage, Gears is a way to do that. And something really important is Gears is open source. It's an open community. Google made Gears because they needed it and they wanted to help the web and wanted to make it in an open way that could also help you, that you can use. So it's an open source community. So that's kind of Gears in a nutshell. Any questions on what Gears is? Um, so I talked about these Gears modules and one thing that's really unique about Gears is it doesn't try to replace like how the web already works. You, you still use JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. It just adds these new modules. It's like icing on the cake. And one of them, for example, is a database module that is a real relational database that we'll be talking about today in a secure way you can store advanced data. You have client-side search. Again, that's going to be one of the important things we'll talk about today. But it gives you the primitives, like we have in Google, that you can use in your client-side web apps. Worker pools. This is a way to run code without causing the browser to get slower. So you can do lots of stuff and the browser stays responsive. There's something called the desktop API. This is a way to drop a shortcut on the user's desktop with their permission so people can reach your web application like they would a desktop application. Local server. This is the magic behind offline. You may have heard of Gears is offline. Gears is larger than that. But local server lets you capture everything you need to work offline. Blobs, I love this one. This allows you to work with binary data. And what it's really about is so you can upload multiple files, for example. Um, you can do resumable uploads, things like that. There's a file system API where, with the user's permission, you can just allow a user to select multiple files, which on the web, surprisingly enough, you can't do today. You can only select one file as you upload. So that works with Blobs so that you can have resumable uploads. Geolocation, this one's really cool. Again, with a user's permission, this is a way for a web application to get the latitude and the longitude. You can turn that into a real location, so you could build location-aware applications, social applications that, that work with your location. And what's unique about it is under the covers, it'll use the best way to get that location. It'll use GPS if that's there. It'll use uh, cell phone towers. Just a few days ago, we launched that it will use Wi-Fi if you're on an open Wi-Fi network, it'll figure that out in most major cities around the world to a certain, to a pretty good degree, like, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but pretty good. Um, and then it'll use IP address. So it, you just say, give me latitude, longitude, and it will find out the best way to do that. Mobile devices, laptops, so that's really cool. So, pub tool search, that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's important to say this is not part of Gears. This is something that I made independently. Um, what it is are these simple scripts that you drop into your page. You sprinkle a little HTML into your page, and it gives you a client-side search engine. Let me show you what this looks like. Let's go right into a demo. So this is going to happen pretty fast. Uh, Pub tool search, like I said, it's a JavaScript library you drop into your page. And then you give it a list of URLs that you want to have indexed. Right? And you give it in a simple file. And these are actually some of the things we'll index. These are actually things from Project Gutenberg. They're books. So we have Descartes, Goethe, Emma Goldman, Machiavelli, Montaigne, Kafka, local, local one, uh, Plato. And um, it's going to grab those, download them, index them into Gears, and then the user can search over them like they would with a search engine, right? And you give it in a simple file, and these are actually some of the things we'll index. These are actually things from Project Gutenberg, they're books. So we have Descartes, Goethe, Emma Goldman, Machiavelli, Montaigne, Kafka, local, local one, uh, Plato. And um, it's gonna grab those, download them, index them into Gears, 
and then the user can search over them like they would with a search engine. And the reason I'm saying this now is that indexing happens really fast. So when I click this, you're going to have to... Well, the first thing you'll see is whether you want to use Gears the first time. Once that happens, boom, you see that processing? It disappeared? It downloaded all those books, indexed them using some of the Gears techniques we'll talk about today, and then it drops a search field into your page. And uh, we can search. So if we start we're searching for the word history, we see in real time it was searching, gives us some results, and so we could... And there is all the full text of Descartes. How? Uh, what is uh, what is something you want to search for? Throw out a word. We'll see if it's in there. Gears. I don't know if we'll, we'll see if Plato comes up for gears or Kafka. Yeah, I didn't think. What's something that might be in a Kafka book? I don't remember which Kafka book it is. You know, how about the. But Kafka. What's that? It's interesting than others. But it's in English. Oh, Castle. Interesting. It's in a lot. And it's Metamorphosis. I don't know why the browser's been a little slow. There you go. And something you noticed, um, it did partial matching there, is the results are like, uh, so before we jump on, I just want to make sure everyone understands what, what this thing is. Right? Any questions? So here's how you use it. So I'm going to begin by, by um, telling you, you just saw the demo, sort of, oh, actually, why? Sorry. So a lot of people are like, why? You know, why do you want to build a client side? You know, what, what, why do you want to do something like this? The first thing is it's fast. Once you've downloaded your local data, you can search over it really fast without having a slow network. So MySpace, for example, has used Gears to download a user's messages, and in the browser, the user can search over all their friends, over all their different things, and it's really fast. There's no network latency. And there's no server. You don't have to set up a server that, that's searching. That if Let's say you wanted to do that real-time thing and have a server responding. Good luck. You don't have to have a pretty fast network, a big server. You could probably do it. Or you could take a couple of minutes and drop a couple of URLs in a file like this. You can take PubTool search. This is open source. Um, you, you'll, I'll give you the URL at the end. And you can have your documents. You can have a subset of your documents. So super simple way to make something that people can search over. It's simple, as you'll see. And finally, one of the important reasons is it's a good example. It's not so simple that it's like a hello world that you guys would get bored, but it's not so complicated like a Gmail that we'd be here for days, right? So it's, it's suitably complex that we can get into some interesting stuff. Let me show you how to use, how to use this library, the, the PubTool search. The first thing is you make a file called search.txt. You give a bunch of URLs. You give a version. And the reason you give a version is we only want to index once. You don't want to re-index every time you load the page. So as you'll see, we check the version. And if that hasn't changed, we don't re-index. If it has, let's say you added something, then that'll get pulled in again. In your HTML, you need to drop this library in. So you drop some CSS in. And you drop some JavaScript files in. And then in your HTML, you just put a magic div in there with a special ID for search tools widget. And when the page loads, it'll insert the form. It'll grab that search.txt file, download the URLs, index them, and then the user can go. And then if you change it, like I said, you just bump the version number. So that's it. So that's really simple to use that library. One of the reasons I like to show that, too, is if you're writing your own JavaScript libraries, you know, it's nice to just make them pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's start cracking this open. Let's start seeing how this thing works. Um, so I'm going to give you an introduction to some of the Gears modules that we use to actually power this. The first one is the database. The database is really cool. 
It's local SQL storage. It's actually based on something called SQLite that's been around for many years. It's a really small open source relational database. It's actually used in iTunes. It's baked in the Mac OS X. And uh, it's actually n not um, sort of a, a boiled down SQL database. It's real. It has virtual tables. It has triggers. It supports a large amount of SQL. Um, it's really full featured. It, you can do gigabytes of storage capacity. If you needed that for your application, it won't fall over. And a lot of times people ask, okay, is this secure? It uses the same thing that other parts of the web use, called the same domain policy. So one website can't read the client-side database of another website. So I just want to ask, who here uses uh, SQL in their work? It's really fun. Once you've got SQL on the client side, you can start doing really cool stuff. Um, you can do really fast ordering and sorts. and, and it, you, you can use the skills you've been using on the server side on the client side, and you'll see that in the code. So this is actually JavaScript. So as you'll see when working with Gears, you always start out <coughs> with a factory call. So we grab the database module. Then you open a database. Databases have names. And then executing SQL is really, really straightforward. Here we are making our table. So we create a table, if it doesn't exist, called test, with two columns, a phrase column and a timestamp. We make the phrase a text type, and a timestamp an integer. So if you work with SQL, that should look straightforward. Inserting a row, again, really straightforward. You call the execute method. And we say insert into the test table some values, two values, and then you just provide an, uh, an array for the columns. So monkey for the phrase, and there's our timestamp. So why do you think we use question marks versus just building up a big string, you know, and, and, and adding things together? That's good. So what's interesting, on the client side, you should never trust anything that's coming from the client side database. So SQL injection attack, is, that's not necessarily the reason. Um, you remember that, like if you've got a server and you're replaying data from the, the client side database, do your standard checking of it. You know, make sure there's not HTML in it, you know, your standard things. The reason is actually for encoding. What if I have a variable here and it has a singular double quote and I, and I um, build up my string? It's going to fail if there's a singular double quote. So it's a way to, to make sure things are escaped correctly. This will do that for you. Like, let's say you have a larger value and there's a, there's a singular double quote, right? Um, getting your results is really straightforward as well. You get a result set. So here we are getting everything from the test table, ordering by the timestamp column, descending. You start seeing this is real SQL. Then we loop over it. So while we have a valid row, we get our two columns, phrase and timestamp. If Firebug is there, we're, you know, we're printing it out, and then we jump to the next one. And then this is interesting. We have a try and we have a finally block. Whether there's an exception or not, we close the result set and we close the database. Why do you think we do that? Was that? Yes, exactly. So gears, when you leave the page, it will close everything. But one of the ideas with Ajax applications is you leave the page open for a long time. Uh, a result set in a database, are, these are real handles, these are real resources, and if you don't close them, they're just going to sit around and you'll gradually have a memory leak. Um, again, if the user leaves the page, that memory will get reclaimed. But, you know, you want someone to, to spend time with your application. You don't want it to run out of memory. So that's a good trick. You should always close those things. So any questions about the database? That's what's so cool. It's straightforward. If you know some SQL, there's really just a couple of methods. And you can start to do some, some cool things. So full text search. What is this? Um, so there's an open source project called FTS2. That stands for Full Text Search. It's a module that makes SQLite uh, searchable in a fast way. Uh, Google actually made it and donated it to SQLite. Um, you have to do a little bit of magic when you create a database that you want to have searched. And I just want to mention, how is this different than a relational database? What this is doing is it's building a very efficient special data structure that indexes all the words, can find them in a specific way, find partial matches. So under the covers, that's what it's doing for you. Here's the syntax. You create what's called a virtual table. 
here we are with a recipe table. You say that special module, and then you give the columns that you want to have indexed. So the di let's say we have a dish and an ingredients column. Searching the database is super straightforward. I want to ask who here's used Lucene for Java, right? So j yeah, or MySQL has uh, full text searching as well now. So this you can think of this kind of like Lucene, but you get to use SQL. So here we are selecting the, from the, di uh, uh, the dish column from the recipe table where the recipe matches. So that's the magic keyword is match. And then you give the thing, you give the query string. And that will find anything that matches tomatoes. And you can actually do some advanced queries. So here we are, this query restricts it to the dish column, has to be a stew, and then finds the word tomatoes anywhere. So that's cool. Worker pool. So this is the last module that I'll introduce to you for gears before we jump into the code. Worker pool. So uh, Brendan Ike invented JavaScript. He used to say, you know, I'll never see threads in JavaScript. Um, and gears worker pools are not threads, actually. They're much simpler. The problem with threads is they have shared state. And then you spend all your time trying to manage that. With workers, first off, I want to give the need. When you run JavaScript today in the browser, if it's doing something intense, the whole browser freezes up. I'm sure you've had this experience, right? You'll go to a JavaScript heavy app, you get the spinning ball or an hourglass and it just freezes for a little bit, and then it, and then it starts continuing because it was running some JavaScript. Um, that's not good. We want to make Ajax applications that, that perform well. So what worker pools do is they run some JavaScript away from the browser's JavaScript engine. And um, you create them, and you give them some JavaScript code to run, and then you send messages back and forth. So you send it a message saying, here's some values to run, and when, whenever it's done, it'll send a message back saying, hey, here's my results. And one thing that's important is the worker pool doesn't have access to the user interface. It can't modify the DOM, can't modify the browser's UI. And that's what allows it to be safe. Because as soon as you touch the browser, you become single-threaded again. So let's look at some code. I'll do it all at once here. Here you see that standard thing with the factory, creating a worker pool. Remember I said that we send messages back and forth? The first thing we do is we set a message handler that's going to get the results on message. And in this code, we're imagining doing something intense, like finding a prime number. Which, which is really computationally intensive. It's so intensive that most cryptography uses those kinds of things. So we might get the next number in some algorithm. Then we create some JavaScript that will get run on the worker. So we make a next prime method that takes in a prime number to find the next one. We would fit that in here. And then uh, when we're done, we have a magic method called send message to send the result, which would go back to here. And then we're doing a trick here. One thing is when we create the worker, we have to pass a string in of the JavaScript to run. We don't want to build up a big string. So we do a trick in JavaScript where you can turn any function into a string. That turns that function into a string. And then we run it. And that's what we pass in. It's a little JavaScript trick there. You can also, there's also a method called create worker by URL if you don't want to do that trick and you just want to put all your worker JavaScript in a separate file. All right, so any questions on the modules? We're, now we're going to go into the architecture of the PubTool search, the client-side search engine. Cool. Yeah? Hmm? Yeah, so the question is, is it possible to see what's in the client-side database and do queries on it? So there is a Gears SDK that you can download that has uh, a, a database tool in it that you just run in your browser, you put on the same web server as your application, and then um, you can run queries. It's just like the MySQL admin tool. It feels the same. That's really cool. And um, so. so one of the cool things you're going to get to see is the architecture of architecting a relatively large-scale JavaScript program. So independent of Gears, you'll see some, some techniques for making a, a, a larger scale JavaScript app maintainable, doing uh, software engineering with it. 
So let's jump in. And pub tool search can be broken down into six classes. Um, so you don't uh, you don't need to always do object oriented programming, but when you're doing dealing with something that may be a little complicated, uh, it's nice to create classes, and each of these classes has one clear responsibility, right? Rather than having everything merged into one big sprawling code base. And I'll talk about the different classes. Um, one thing you'll see too is JavaScript has no native support for public and private. Like in Java, you know, you can make something accessible. You cannot make something accessible. Again, when you're doing something that's starting to get larger, you want to have clear encapsulation. And you can do encapsulation in JavaScript. So when you create your classes, you can have what are clearly public methods. And then JavaScript doesn't natively support private methods, or what you could think of as your implementation methods. So the, um, the standard thing to do is to have underscores, either at the beginning or the end. Right, So that's a way to kind of cleanly divide, hey, here's my public contract with you, and then I'm going to shelter you from the internal details. So we're going to start to wind deeper and deeper into, into the system. So let me just kind of tell you about some of the classes. You have a search tools class. This is a singleton. It's the entry point into the system. It's really simple. It gives you one method, search. It takes a query. And also a handle error method. You'll see which these other guys call to consistently handle errors. As you'll see, a lot of the things in this are asynchronous, which means they run and then you have to wait for a while until they come back. And that kind of code can get really complicated unless you're careful, so we do some tricks to make the code more maintainable. Um, you've got a UI class, and that, what do you think it does? It handles the UI, it embeds that little search field, it can display results. We have a search manifest class. Remember that search.txt file that I showed you with the URLs? This one handles fetching it, it handles parsing it. Um, you have a documents class. That can take an array of documents to download. It can fetch them, it can process them. You have an indexer and a searcher. These internally d do the indexing. They do some work to do that. And then the searcher does the search. And it also internally creates snippets. You know, when you search on Google, for example, you see a little snippet where your term is bolded. It does these. And as you'll see, these classes actually run on a worker pool. But the code to work with, with worker pools can get kind of complicated. So again, we're encapsulated from the internal complexity. So that's kind of the high level. Here's the classes, you know, here's the classes in our system. So now I want to take you into the flow. So let's look at indexing. So what happened with indexing? So first off, we've got the search tools class. That's our entry point. When, first thing is we, we need to get a database name. Remember you saw the open method? So we generate a database name uh, uh, dynamically because you might be using this. Um, you know, we, we just want to be careful. We create our database tables. We'll, you'll get to see what those are. And then we wait for the page to finish loading. And you're going to see a little label that says asynchronous. Does that, does that word make sense, asynchronous? Um, as opposed to synchronous. So you know, we wait for the page to finish loading. We have to give a call back generally, and then things come back. Then, once we're loaded, the, we create the UI class, which initializes the UI, embeds that widget into the page using that magic div, using the ID you gave. We come back to the search tools class. We get the search manifest URL. By default, it's search.txt, but you can override it using a meta tag, actually, if you wanted to put it somewhere else. Then we make a search manifest class, and we give it that URL. And this one, you know, we just hand it, hey, here's that URL. It fetches it and parses it into a form that we can use, which is asynchronous. And then we ask a question. Remember, you, remember that version number? Once we've parsed it, we ask, do we need to index? Um, and we do that by saving the version number in the relational database. So we'll have a metadata table that has it in there. If, it, if it's the same, then we're done. But if it's different, then we need to index. And now you see a new symbol. Whenever you see this, it means we're talking into the relational database. So we need to save the new search manifest version, right? So we can use it across page loads to see if things have changed. And then our search manifest class has parsed our list of URLs. 
and we take those and we say we want to download these documents but before we download those documents we want to make sure we we know what their mind type is right so you saw all those books some of them were text some of them were HTML um, we need to figure out their mime type and uh, a mime type is just a short string that tells you what kind of file is hey this is a gif this is a ping file this is text this is html and we'll need that later as you'll see when we do snippet generation the way we do this is we do what's called an http head request so in http you can do git requests which talks to the server sends you back some metadata and sends back all the contents a head request just sends back the metadata so you can efficiently find out for each of the URLs, hey, what is this thing? Oh, and the server says, that's an HTML file. Oh, that's uh, a text file. And then, if we're HTML, XML, or text, we can go ahead and download those documents. So one of the things we want, too, is we want to make sure we don't try to download something we can't work with. What if someone's put a PDF file in there? Or a Microsoft Word file? It'll probably break things. So, ha so having the MIME type means we can throw away those and just take the ones we can work with. So we download each of these documents. That's asynchronous. Now here's an interesting thing. We don't wait to download every document in that manifest file, like we're downloading each of the books, for example. We don't wait to the end to index. We actually, as each one comes in, we call the indexer class. So why do you think we interleave this? Well, we have lots of time in between. Networks are slow. Your local computer is fast. Most of the time, if I'm downloading a bunch of things, I'm going to be sitting around waiting. That's time that I can use to do useful work. So as each document comes in, I call the indexer class, which will do the hard work of indexing it so we can search over it. And so it interleaves. So the user will feel like there's better performance overall, less time to wait. Now, the indexer, you're going to see a new thing. Whenever you see this, that means it's actually running on a worker. It's running on one of those things that won't block the browser because, you know, these books might be big, they might be big documents. So the first thing we do on the worker is we extract the title. So if it's HTML, we go in, we look for a title tag. Um, we don't get a title for HTML or XML currently. And then, on the worker, we insert a new row into that full text search table. You remember when I showed you the, the client-side search syntax? And you saw, you, you know, I, to insert a row, you just use a normal SQL insert statement. But because that table was marked as searchable, in the background, that'll kick off, causing Gears and SQLite to do its magic on it, break it down, build up that, that data structure. And so that's what we do here. And we do that on a worker because, you know, that could be fairly intense. Like, um, you know, if you have a, a, a book. And then, when all the documents are downloaded and indexed, we're done. So that's indexing. Any questions about indexing? All right. So for searching is, is simpler. Same thing. The UI class, the user indicates they want to search using a query string. As they type, each time, we kick off a search. And we call that, we call a search method on the search tools class, which kicks it off. Then we instantiate one of these searcher objects. And again, this runs asynchronously because everything that goes into a worker becomes asynchronous. And again, one of the nice things is we're encapsulated from the internal details. And inside of that, it uses that SQL syntax. Remember that match keyword? So it takes the query on the worker and it matches anyone who, who matches that query. And then it, for each of the matches, it generates a snippet. So we want this to feel like a search engine. And search engines make a nice, you know, they take part of the text where things match. They bold the word. But that's dynamic. So we have to do that during searching. And we do that on a worker, too, because it's a lot of string handling. That's a great thing for workers when they're string handling. Yes? Is it possible to call the worker once we initiated to stop it from doing what it's doing? So the question is, is it possible to kill a worker, essentially? Yeah. So um, 
so yeah so you can either stop a worker or you could have something that sends a message to the worker to stop um, or the result could come back from the worker and you set a flag hey I'm gonna ignore this so you, you've got some different options yeah once you've generated the result snippets those come back as a nice array right here's the result and then the UI class takes those and they display the results and that knows how to display things so we've separated user interface from that behavior and then we're done so that's searching so now that you've seen the classes you've seen some of the flow now you're gonna get to see some real code and we're gonna use that code to actually teach you things from the dojo project it's kinda like a bonus you get to kind of see this things used in the JavaScript toolkit. Um, who here has heard of Dojo? Okay, so Dojo uh, is—I don't know if you, if you were here at the earlier presentation. There's a lot of really good JavaScript toolkits out there: uh, jQuery, YUI, Prototype. Dojo is a good option as well. It's the one I'm personally familiar with because I'm, I'm in that project. Um, just have some fun. These are the two founders. Just wanted to throw some bling into the presentation. Dylan Sheeman and uh, Alex Russell. Um, so you, you obviously know what Dojo is, so I'll just run through. It's open source. It's actually three pieces. You have a small core that's 24K. It gives you a bunch of stuff. Just drop it in your page. You have Digit, which are user interface widgets. And then Dojo X, which is a place with all sorts of cool plugins that you may not need all the time, but when you need them, you need them. And one of the things, here's an interesting thing. When I started writing PubTools Search, it started out small, and I noticed I was starting to write my own JavaScript library. You know what I'm talking about? Like you write a method that can work with multiple styles on a class. You write a method that can you know, make, make working with XML and HP requests a little easier. And as soon as I find myself doing that, I stop and I grab one of the, the JavaScript libraries. Because that's an indicator to me that my project's getting large enough that I need one of these libraries. I don't tend to start with them, but if I find that I'm starting to build essentially a, a library, then that's when I start to use these. And that's what happened here. So that's a good indicator for you as well. If you're, if you're starting to write more than one or two helper methods, stop. <laughs> Grab one of the toolkits. One of the things that's unique about Dojo is it has this build system. You don't have to use it. You can just drop the core file in. But I, again, as a project gets larger, there's ways to make things faster by kind of putting all your JavaScript together. And Dojo has a build system for that. And the only reason I, I bring that up is um, I did a special build for PubTools for the Dojo stuff. And the reason I did that is by default, everything on Dojo is Dojo. See, like Dojo.hitch, Dojo.style. But I wanted this library to be usable on a web page that may already have Dojo. It may have an older version of Dojo or a newer version. So um, I renamed space. So in all the code snippets you see, you're going to see PU, which means PubUtils, which means I've renamed space Dojo. And I did that so there'd be no collisions. Because I don't know where this is going to be used. All right, let's jump right in with some code. So in this, you're going to get to see Dojo for each, Dojo XML HTTP request. This is actually the download method. So remember we got the documents class and it's given an array of things to download. So the download method takes an array of things to download and it actually makes an indexer initially. And it does that just to tell the indexer, hey, there's 10 documents, there's 20 documents. Because remember, everything's asynchronous here. And remember we interleave indexing and downloading and the indexer needs to know when it's done. So that just records the index goes, oh, okay, I know I need to download 20 things. When I've gotten the 20th thing, I'm done. Then you see for each. So Dojo for each will take like an array and then run a function over every single one of them. So for each of them, each of the documents, we get an entry and we, we run this code. And each of the documents has a URL and it has a MIME type. Remember we got that during filtering? And then we run this method right here, dojo.xhrget, that's basically an Ajax call. And to use it, you just provide an object literal with some named parameters. So you give the URL to download, you give a load and an error function, load will get called, 
when the results return, an error will get called if there's an error. So it's pretty straightforward. So the data comes in, which is the document we've downloaded, a bunch of text, a bunch of XML, HTML, and we call the indexer that we made up here. We give it a URL, a MIME type, and the data. Inside of that, that indexer thing does its thing in a worker, but we're protected from that. If there's an error, we call our search tool singleton, remember? There's one of those, that's the entry point. We say, handle this error. And again, whenever you start getting really asynchronous, you don't want to have error handling sprinkled all over your system. So a lot of what you're seeing here is to make JavaScript code that's very asynchronous maintainable. And that's relatively straightforward. If you weren't, you know, if you were to just like unroll all this, you know, the code can get really, really pretty, pretty nasty. So. so Dojo Declare. So JavaScript gives you a way to do object-oriented programming. You can simulate it using what's called the prototype. Who here has done JavaScript object-oriented programming using the prototype? Yeah. You don't always need it. Using a bunch of functions is fine. But again, when you get to a certain scale, you want to start sort of modularizing things. And JavaScript prototype, the prototype way of programming, can actually be hard to follow sometimes for, for more junior programmers. And so it's nicer to make your code a little more readable. Um, Dojo Declare gives you a way to create JavaScript classes that's a little more readable. And here we actually see us declaring the searcher class using this. So you give the name of your class, you give, a su you give the super class if you want to descend from something, which is tricky in JavaScript, but it, it, it does that for you. We don't, we don't do any subclassing in this project. And then you give an object literal of the methods. There's our three methods, search, escape string, and git snippet. And there you see us doing information hiding. There's our public method again. There's our two private implementation methods. Um, and then you can see, so search takes a query string which is asynchronous, so there's the callback when it's done, and so on. So that's pretty straightforward. Hitch. This one's a little tricky to explain. Um, this is the declaration for the documents class. Remember the one that downloads everything? Here's our list of methods, so the constructor, a filter function, a download function. So when you start doing JavaScript object-oriented programming, you start running into callbacks in general, right? Do you do something and you call back? In JavaScript, you have what's called this, the this keyword. So if I've got an instance, I have to use this whenever I want to refer to it. Does that make sense? Um, what happens is JavaScript can get confusing. I can give a function to the callback, and then that gets called, but it no longer refers to the instance. Uh, if you call this, it'll actually be the window object. Has anyone run into that? Have you run into that bug? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. And so people start, what they do is they'll store a reference to the in instance they want to work with, and so on. Dojo has something nice called hitch. So right here, remember, we want to filter and then download. So by default, the filter method takes some URLs to filter and a callback. If we, were, if we didn't use hitch and we just passed in this.download, when filter was done and it called that, this would get called and this would not work. What hitch does is it allows you to take an instance and take a function and hitch them together and it will return a new function that when I call here will correctly call it on the instance and then now that will work. That's kind of tricky. Did that, did that make some sense? Yeah? Okay. So that's really nice because it keeps me from littering my code to handle instance type things. So just like jQuery, who here has used jQuery? Yeah, it's nice, right? The querying syntax is really nice. Uh, Dojo has something similar, it's called Dojo Query. So here's some code where we actually, wh what you can do is you can give a CSS selector, which is like, you know, use CSS, use dot for classes or hash for IDs. 
and you can use that to get anything on your page and it makes your code a lot more readable so you don't have a bunch of DOM code which has to iterate over everything. Uh, in this, we actually put class names on that search field that we embed in the page and one of them is that. So we're actually grabbing that input element and then getting the value to get the query string. So we have an event handler that every time there's a key press, we just re-grab that. So, so the query, it's a, you know, it's not a great example because it's probably relatively easy to get it. But um, when you start having a sophisticated UI, you can have a bunch of buttons on your page, for example, that have some specific class. Get them with this and then iterate over each one with dot for each or dot animate on it. So that's really nice. And there we are searching with the query. Um, by ID, what this does, here's some code that actually gets, remember you have to give that magic ID, st-widget. Here we are grabbing that and uh, working with it. By ID does two things. One, it's, if it, you, you're, you don't have to type get element by ID over and over and over again. And it actually does some internal magic to, to fix some bugs for Internet Explorer, which is interesting. I won't go into them. But it actually handles some edge cases to make things work better. So some tics and tips and tricks. You've seen a little bit of Dojo with some real code. Um, when you work with gears, um, you want to do your intensive operations on workers. So workers can actually talk on the database. They can talk on the network. Um, when you do the full text search, the first version of PubTool search I built, I used no workers. Right? Whenever I did indexing, I did it on the main JavaScript thread. Whenever I did searching, and, and searching took minutes. Like, I was, I was like, oh, this will never work. It's like, it was frozen, took minutes. Um, I moved it onto a worker. It was nearly instantaneous. And that's because whenever you hit the database, you're hitting the hard drive, which locks things up. So you want to use the worker. We're not doing offline on this, but what's nice is you could have a worker that is maybe doing synchronization for an offline app using gears and so on. And so this is a good, good tip. It can really help. So MySpace, for example, when they integrated gears. They didn't use workers, moved over to them, and made the performance so much better. And the final thing. A real trick, um, so again, I really, I, I like keeping things in classes. Um, so this is the indexing, the indexer class. We've got this public index function, right, which is really simple. And then we've got these two methods, index worker and get title. And those actually run on the worker. But I wanted to keep everything bundled together because they conceptually go together. So just using like a similar trick, here we are making our worker script that will get run on the worker. We create, we say a get title function, and we stringify this function using that same string trick. And then we set an on message handler that will get run when we message the worker with this function. Does that make sense? So we've built up this string using these functions. Those are what are going to get run on the worker. But we kept it a little simpler by not having to, to replicate all that code here. It's a, little, it's a little advanced, but that makes some sense. Right, let's say I didn't have this. All the code that's in here, I just put right in there. You get a giant string to pass into the worker. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind is when, when workers are talking to each other. So here we are with that worker script you just saw. I can build up a message, and they can be real JavaScript. And I just send the message over. And it will automatically send JavaScript between the two. You used to have to turn it into a string in older versions of Gears, but that's, that's uh, fixed. So you can send pretty advanced messages between workers. All right, so this is a good trick. So closure can be a big, scary word. Um, if you were to crack open the JavaScript for search tools, what you'd see is that everything is wrapped with a function, right? And we've got the declarations for all of our classes. Because at the end of the day, external to us, no one needs to know about these, right? Let's say I got rid of that and that and just had that. Anyone externally, it, it would pollute the namespace. 
all of these classes would be sitting around. Um, again, information hiding is good. So all of these are just implementation details to produce a search tools class that has one method, search. So a closure, these are hidden externally. So we actually make the function, and you see the little parentheses there? That runs the function. So this is a really nice trick. Again, when you're doing larger scale JavaScript, and a lot of this presentation is just to give you tricks for larger scale JavaScript. You can use this, again, so, um, uh, what are those, 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 those dolls with the, the... Exactly, you know? So even though we, I showed you public and private methods here, these classes themselves are private. So it's kind of like that, right? The hidden, 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 hidden. And again, this is really needed. When you start making something like Gmail, you want to start doing JavaScript like this. Um, we're just going to run through two more methods to show you. Create database tables. This creates our database. There we are getting the module. We're opening it. Here we make a client metadata table, which has a version. Remember, that's the version from the manifest. We have a schema version. So when you start having a long-lived Ajax app with a relational database, you might have to migrate to SQL, right? So we just give a, a, a version to the schema. And then you could imagine, let's say we change it in the future, we see that and we can upgrade it. Just like Ruby on Rails has a, an upgrade and downgrade. And then we have a flag whether we were able to successfully finish indexing. It's like, let's say we load the page, we start indexing, the browser crashes. We don't want to be in a weird state. So at the very end, we just set a flag, we're done. And we can see that if the page loads again. Here we are making the table that really does most of the work. Here's, here's a full text search table, a virtual table called client search. Has several columns. And the real magic is the content. So when we set the content, it'll index. And then here's the final worker. You can get to see, um, here's the index worker. You can get to see the kind of the stuff that runs on the worker. So this takes some arguments to work with. Um, we extract a title, grab the URL, the MIME type, the doc. That got sent to the worker. We open the database on the worker. Here it is, insert in that client search table, these columns, these values. Uh, this is actual contents. And the, 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 the indexing by gears happens right here. And then it happens on the worker because we're running in a worker. Then we close, just like I mentioned. And then we send a message back to the browser, hey, we're done. We index this particular document. So that's the index worker. Uh, we're going to jump through search. We don't have time, unfortunately. I apologize. This is this is what's on the. That was the worker for search. Yes. Yeah. No, no, it runs on whatever thread is calling it. No. Yes. So SQLite is not a client server system. It's an embedded, it's an embedded database. Um, so status, you can grab PubTool search here. You can grab gears here. Dojo is here. Uh, Google Code is a great place to get involved with some of these things. The, you can download the slides. Here's the tiny URL. Uh, if you want to grab some of these URLs or this code yourself. And uh, are there any questions? There's a lot of, that's a lot of material. I said this is the one. This is the fire hose talk. So, right on. Well, feel free to come up afterwards, and thank you so much.